So good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Skinner, founder of Marketing Kind, and welcome to this Marketing Kind exchange, in which we'll be asking, can we rescue humanity? With Ian Goldin, and of course, my co-host and fellow Marketing Kind member, Arun J. Katakam. As we have many guests with us this evening, here is a brief introduction to Marketing Kind. We are a community of business leaders, marketers, and change makers who believe the solutions to the world's most pressing problems depend upon new forms of human cooperation and are therefore also marketing briefs in disguise. As a community, we come together to support each other in becoming more conscious leaders. We use our expertise to support good causes and we seek to understand and influence the stories that drive the bigger systems we, that we are all part of. Which brings us perfectly to this evening's theme. So uh, with the lifting at last of COVID restrictions, can we finally start to look forward to a better future again? Or if we're not careful, could there in fact still be worse to come? In this evening's conversation, we'll have the chance to explore what narratives can best help us to understand and address our challenges as we emerge from the cloud of the pandemic. Now, we've tackled some big topics in marketing kind exchanges previously, for example, uh, capitalism and its alternative futures. But while it's become commonplace to cite concerns over a diminution of trust in business in recent years, there are, of course, far deeper concerns about the nature of the world that business has to operate in in the first place. Last summer, a study led by Bath University surveyed 10,000 young people across 10 different nations around the world and found that 56% of them believe that humanity is doomed. Just in the last few weeks, a group including many of the world's leading scientists, among them 11 Nobel laureates, appeared to share much of this concern when they reset the doomsday clock to 100 seconds to midnight, which means that, in their view at least, we are as close to what they term civilization-ending apocalypse as we have ever been. So the topic of uh, Ian's book, Rescue from Global Crisis to a Better World, uh, and the theme of this evening's conversation, Can We Rescue Humanity, could hardly be more pressing. We face a nexus of challenges as we attempt to engage with a recovery amid the very uneven impact of COVID, rising inequalities, uh, a cost of living crisis, the backdrop, of course, of an evolving climate emergency with increasing extreme weather events, the risk of further social fracturing, um, the rising in um, geopolitical tensions, um, uh, and of course, a technology environment that multiplies new threats as well as opportunities. So what are the narratives that we should most let go of because they're no longer helping us? How can we reconcile what so often seem to be conflicting priorities? Uh, and what are some of the bigger ideas that we can turn to in coming together to create a better post-pandemic world and a safer, more attractive world for us to live and work in? And we couldn't be in better company to find our way through these challenges. Ian is Professor of Globalization and Development at the University of Oxford and is a founding director of the Oxford Martin School, which was established to build solutions to the world's most complex problems. His previous roles included serving as vice president of the World Bank, as advisor to President Nelson Mandela, and he has written not two or three, but 23 books, authored and presented three BBC documentary series, and has appeared on BBC's Hard Talk. But this is his first time being interviewed at Marketing Kind. So welcome, Ian, and maybe just to, to get us started, since we've talked about what narratives can we use to understand our challenges, um, there are quite a few and sort of metaphors already being used for thinking about the recovery. There's the, the Great Reset promoted by the World Economic Forum, 
Um, there's the idea of rebooting our economy. Um, there's the, the notion that I've most come across previously from the humanitarian sector of building back better. Um, and of course, a lot of people after two years of intense disruption simply want to get back to normal uh, or even back to a new normal. So where uh, do these metaphors really fall short? Um, and why do we need the alternative of the idea of rescue? Well, thanks very much, Paul and Arunja, for hosting me and Paul for uh, what you've done with Marketing Kind. It sounds like an extraordinary idea that you're both taking on to help develop new forms of human consciousness and to create conscious leaders. And I'm delighted if um, this conversation that we're about to have can in any way support that, because that's certainly what we need. Um, and um, and I congratulate you on the initiative that that you've taken. Um, I think the the language that um, that you've cited some of, uh, like building back better, like reset, um, reboot, is really what scares me. Um, because when we reset or reboot our operating systems of our computers, which is what I think about when I, I hear the word. Uh, we go back to the, the, the system that's programmed in there before. It's that system which brought us the pandemic. It's that system which is bringing us rising inequality, the climate emergency, uh, the bads. And it's that which will absolutely inevitably lead to a much more fractured, much more risky, much more uncertain, less cohesive future. And the same goes with some other language that's used. People talk about bouncing back, uh, even bouncing forward. That implies we're keeping on the same road, the same tracks that, that we're on. It's that road which is leading over a precipice. Um, and so I don't want to bounce forward, <laughs> go faster down this road, which is leading over a precipice. I think we need to think very differently. Uh, and we need to, as much as we desire, a return to normality and I do as much as all the other participants uh, do and people around the world do we need to deeply digest why we are where we are and if we don't want this to happen again if we want a more certain more predictable more cohesive world a safer world for ourselves for our children a world where biodiversity can flourish and people can flourish um, then we need to do things very differently. And I think we're at that inflection point, and that's why I wrote Rescue, because I feel it very strongly, that the danger is, and it's a danger which is amplified by our desire to slip back into this normal normalcy. The danger is that we think the pandemic's over, <laughs> that's over, Let's go back and party. Let's go back and do the things we were before. And that's always the danger. So while this is still fresh, while we feel the scars of this pandemic, while it's in our consciousness, we need to make this decision not to build back on shaky foundations. Build back better, yes, but you can't build back unless you completely restructure the foundations. Otherwise, the house will collapse again. The system will collapse again. We need to think quite fundamentally about why we are where we are and how we ensure we don't get back to the same place again. And that's what the book's about. And to that end, Ian, the pandemic has united us all in facing a common problem, but it hasn't affected us equally, as you just mentioned. So who do you feel has to be rescued most and why? I think we, you know, we all need to be rescued. We like in, like we've all been on a big ocean liner. We might have been in our own cabins, but it's the Titanic. Um, and everyone is affected from the poorest on the, on the boat to the richest. Uh, of course, like in the Titanic, the rich <laughs> get to the life, life first. They're better hospitals. They're not as vulnerable. They're not in the hold uh, or deep down in the engine room. So they... They have escaped much. And when you look at the data on the pandemic, both within countries and between countries, there are these huge differentials. You know, in the UK, for example, Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups are four times as likely to have died 
um, from the pandemic as people in the neighborhood I live in in Oxford. Uh, and, um, and this is true more broadly. And of course, around the world, you see it. So if you have good access to healthcare, if you have a private car, if you've got a job that doesn't require that you go to work, um, you've got social insurance, you can escape to your home in the Hamptons or into the Cotswolds, you're fine. Uh, but if you go in crowded transport and live seven to a house uh, and have no privacy, uh, you're not fine. Um, and that's what we've seen in, in, in all the data. So it's been hugely differential, but we all need to be rescued because the uncertainties that are being created by systemic risk, what I call the butterfly defect of globalization, this inherent instability that the system is creating, is going to be catastrophic for everyone. Yes, poor people in poor countries suffer first and hardest. They always do. And poor people in the UK or other countries suffer most because they don't have insurance, they can't escape, etc. But the tensions that are rising, as we see in the UK and we see in the US, even the very powerful countries affect everyone um, in dramatic ways, threaten democracy, uh, create geopolitical tensions, which could lead to catastrophic war, which mean we're not resolving the climate emergency as effectively as we should be. Everyone is affected by a society that fracture. That's what Roosevelt and Churchill recognized um, in the Second World War. <laughs> the rich did not escape. Um, and so we all need to be rescued. Of course, the type of rescue and what happens is different for different groups, which are affected in very, very different ways. I want to, to, to build on a couple of those points and um, to stress test the notion of, of rescue for a brief moment. I mean, you allude, allude to the to the two wars and in your book you write about how um, although the, the Second World War was in many ways a bigger catastrophe, our response to it was much better. Um, but if we think of, you know, thinking of Neil Ferguson, for example, um, has essentially suggested that we can't think of those crises as isolated separate events, that they're part of a broader continuum. Um, and we, you talked about the, the butterfly defect from one of your previous books. In our introduction, um, we looked at the whole sort of nexus of crises that are sort of morphing into each other. So what might you say to somebody who would claim that um, essentially with all of these different crises morphing into each other, we can't really extricate ourselves from that. We can't rescue ourselves from that. We'd be better off accepting that crisis is an underlying part of reality and that we'd be better off finding a way to adapt to it and to better live with the, that reality of circumstance. Yeah, there are lots of things that can be said about this. The first thing is that when you get rescued, it doesn't mean that your life is going to be fine. It means you live to fight another day. It means you have an opportunity to carry on. It means that you can create a new world for yourself. And um, that's the situation we're in. I absolutely agree that these crises are interlinked. And it's very difficult to dissemble them at all. And that's what the butterfly defect's all about, this complex dynamic system and the instability it generates and the cascading crises that go across silos. A health crisis becomes an economic crisis, becomes a geopolitical crisis, um, et cetera. But the, uh, what I would argue is that any of these crises create an opportunity to think afresh and restructure the whole system. The Second World War was a conflict, a, you know, a war in Europe, but it created a welfare state in the UK. Mm. Um, it created free education for, for people, a whole bunch of people and all sorts of other benefits in the, in the US. Mm. Uh, it led to systemic changes uh, because people recognized that there were systemic reasons for the war and that they needed systemic change after the war. Uh, so they are interlinked, but, you know, the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, all of these things, which had, weren't, they weren't NATO, which was, a, you know, which was later, it wasn't, a, it wasn't about war. It was recognizing 
that unless you had a systemic response, you'd have another world war. But you needed to deal with poverty. You needed to deal with reparations, with debt, with all the other things that, that the Bretton Woods institutions, the Marshall Plan, the United Nations uh, deal with. I mean, the United Nations scope is vast. Many would argue too vast. But, um, but no one could say that it's not systemic. Um, at least systemic then. I would argue it's not systemic now because there are a lot of issues which aren't included in the UN. But for the time of 1945, it was systemic. Uh, and so what Rescue is really arguing is let's use this op opportunity, as was the war, to create a new world order which deals with all these systemic issues, which stops... Um, whether it's the climate crisis or a health crisis or inequality crisis, geopolitical crises, cybersecurity, space debris, they all have a common theme associated with them. And that's um, what we need to, to tackle. So I agree with, with um, Neil that these, these crises are interlinked. I don't agree with him in that there's sort of an inevitability. Resilience is very important. There will be more crises, no matter how good we are at creating systemic responses, we need to accept that this complex dynamic system will cause more surprises, that this 90 minutes we're spending together is the slowest 90 minutes we'll know for the rest of our lives. And we need to prepare for that. And the surprise and uncertainty that is generated by this cooking that's happening at the world level for more and more educated people, consuming more, more connected with more and more technology. But that is different, in my view. Building resilience and building a capacity to deal with surprise is different to saying we're going off the edge of a cliff, which is where I think we're going uh, if we don't act differently because of climate, because of uh, in intensifying pandemic threats, um, et cetera. The, those numbers you cited um, in the introduction of 56% of people and from, I guess, the University of Bath survey. Uh, this is terrifying stuff. Um, or we pass midnight or closer to midnight, whatever you, metaphor you want to use. That, my view is that can be dealt with in, in a systemic way. Uh, and you see this mood swing that happened after the Second World War. A lot of people in the Second World War had lived through the First World War. They knew this was a repetitive problem unless there was systemic change. That's why they were prepared to embrace systemic change. And they did, big time. And you know, the most remarkable thing which I write about in the book, which, which is still difficult for me to comprehend, is that Churchill, who was the obviously the absolute war hero, was deposed in a landslide victory by an unknown bland Clematley six weeks after the end of the war. After delivering the UK from almost certain German invasion, we'd all be speaking German today. How does, you know, the mood, the appetite for change was so great that, they, that because Churchill wouldn't embrace the fullness of what people wanted, even though he had delivered the UK from war. He came back later when he had a more radical agenda. Thanks, Ian. And <clears throat> the word rescue conveys the seriousness of the challenges as you just outlined, but also gives us hope that there's a way out of them. And your book is a book of solutions, not just problems. Could you bring to life two or three of the solutions that you think could make the biggest difference? Well, one of the reasons I'm very optimistic is that a lot of things that people said were absolutely impossible, unimaginable almost, in January 2020, are now commonplace. You know, the speed at which governments and individuals, communities, cities, and others can change, or pharmaceutical companies can deliver drugs, for example, is unprecedented. Um, and that is a cause of immense optimism, <laughs> you know, and this is across the, across the political spectrum. Uh, if the Conservative Party had said in January 2020, we're going to uh, increase debt 
by 40 percent to the highest level in peacetime. You know, the, the, whoever said that in the Conservative Party would have been expelled. But even the Labour Party wouldn't have tolerated someone saying that um, at the time. So certainly post Jeremy Corbyn. So um, and that became acceptable. Or if government's telling us that we can't do this, that or that we as individuals restricting our behavior in various ways, wearing masks, not going out, avoiding other people, changing our behavior in fundamental ways that had taken Asians generations to learn, um, like for mask wearing, for example, uh, we, we did overnight. Not everyone. Of course, there's small minorities that oppose these things, but the overwhelming majority of people acted in the public interests their own interest, but in the public interest. And those acts of solidarity, you know, uh, including people putting their lives on the line all the time, the nurses, the care workers, the doctors, and other essential workers who were exposing themselves knowledgeably, and you see it in the data on deaths and contagion, uh, certainly initially in the pandemic, people were making sa uh, the sacrifice of life for other people. Um, no one can say that we're humanity is basically selfish, self-centered. We only act for ourselves. Um, people don't make sacrifices. And although it's a, it's a terrible thing because people have suffered awfully in that. But to me, the extent to which we have demonstrated an ability to change behavior as individuals, as communities, and that governments have, I mean, there's absolutely no excuse when we come to the climate emergency or when we come to dealing with other things. We've also learned that for the rich countries, we can roll out these drugs very quickly. We need to do it for the world. Yeah. It's interesting. It's uh, something that's come up in, in previous marketing kind exchanges is how when we've been thinking about some of the narratives that guide us individually or collectively is how you know, even in the case of a disaster or an emergency, the direct and unavoidable impact of a disaster is usually less, um, however serious it may be, than the total cumulative impact of the narratives that guide how we prepare for it, how we interpret it, how we respond to it, how we adapt to it, how we recover from it, and so on. Um, and it's very powerful in the book that you see even something as as bad as the the, the pandemic as also being an opportunity to um to to create a, a better world as the theme of the conversation um i of course read rescue when it first came out in hardback um it looks like from the chat comments that some more copies are, are currently being sold but uh, uh the paperback i think came out just last month uh, i wonder ian uh in the time between the hardback and the paperback coming out where have we uh, if anywhere, have we moved closer to a successful rescue mission? Uh, and where have we fallen further away from one? Yeah. Well, uh, um, I think there, there, there are two, two thoughts I have. I mean, the one interesting thing is that I think the hardback came out in about September and the paperback in January. So this is a very close time between paperback and hard time. Normally there's a year or more. Um, but the publishers, um, which are the same as your publishers, um, gave me the opportunity to, to change it. They said, do you want to change anything in the book? And so I thought about this question about, has something changed? Because I finished Rescue, I guess, in about May. Um, you know, they, they did a very quick job of, of publishing it in September. Uh, so between May and... I think they, they, they needed my changes for the paperback by December. Between May and December, did anything change? And I don't think anything did. In fact, I was very interested to read yesterday, for example, that, um, that there's just there's new data on this point that you made, uh, Arunja, about the differential impact of the pandemic, the inequality. And it, and it just... And there's new data on mental health and there's new data on lots of the different things I talk about. There's also new data on remote work and productivity and creativity, which is a theme I pick up on. None of the stuff that, that's come out has, has um, in any way led me to change my mind. Unfortunately, 
because the book had also been well copy edited, I didn't make a single change between the hardback and the paperback um, because I felt comfortable with the content. And then when I, as far as I can see, I mean, do, do whoever's participating, if you find an error of any type, do, do email me because hopefully there'll be another edition and I can fix it. But um, so the answer is, I think we haven't learned a huge amount in this intervening period that would lead me to change my mind. I think the you know a question is are we getting now that the UK is, the UK is sort of returning to, officially to normal <laughs> to normal life um, that the danger increases of slipping back to complacency and not making the system change. I think you know that's what's increasingly worrying me is that. The, there's no movement, really. Um, and this goes to, to the heart of a problem that I identify in the book, which is global, the global system is totally broken. Uh, this was an opportunity to fix the WHO so it stops the next pandemic. That doesn't seem to be happening. This was an opportunity to, to fix the international aid system, but actually the opposite's happened. Aid has been cut and developing countries are more on their own than ever, not only on vaccine solidarity, but in terms of other things. Um, the, and of course, the Ukraine crisis um, and the brooding tensions between the US and China are distracting very, uh, from, from the bigger picture and creating a new, new Cold Wars, not only with Russia, but with China too. And that's, to me, the most concerning. It was obviously happening before the, the paperback came out, um, but it seems to be getting worse. And in my view, we can't do any global rescue unless we have China and US talking to each other. Um, there's no fixing the WHO. There's no dealing with the climate emergency. There's no... Um, restoring growth and development, et cetera, et cetera, without more solidarity. And the great danger we face is that, is that we're in the First World War, not the Second World War. Um, in other words, this isn't a moment which is leading to more solidarity. It's a moment which is sowing the seeds for a bigger crisis. Absolutely, Ian, and that's, that's very worrying. Um, I think everything you said there is is just uh, reverberating because you know this. It's it's almost the disbelief for those of us who um, who can see this so clearly and and just um, you know why hasn't some of these changes already happened? In fact, uh, as you mentioned, we're going in the wrong direction. So. I wanted to take a step back from the book a little bit to understand a little bit your insights and ambitions from your you know, earlier experiences, especially you, know, you advised President Nelson Mandela during an extraordinary time in South Africa's history. What do you most carry with you from that experience when you look at the problems we face today? What I most carry is that... Um, you know, what, what Mandela um, said, it always seems impossible till it's done. Um, and he had spent 27 years in jail. He never thought he would live a life outside jail, let alone become president. I, in a much smaller way, was in exile. I never thought I would come back to South Africa, uh, let alone work for, Man uh, for Mandela and run the state bank. Uh, in my lifetime. And, uh, and it's, it's one of the reasons I'm optimistic. And you see these moments all the time. These are not isolated events. Change happens in surprisingly rapid ways uh, and, and cascades. It's the same butterfly defect being a butterfly a real butterfly effect, <laughs> um, where, where something good starts somewhere. In this case, it was the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and it ripples. 50 countries around the world become democratic in a five-year period. The Cold War ends. South Africa uh, is no longer 
shorn up strategically by the UK and the US and everyone else. And the political mood changes. If you're going to have human rights, you better have them in South Africa too. Um, and suddenly everyone supports change. Uh, and, it, and that ripple happens quickly. We've seen it in the Me Too movement. We've seen it um, in Greater Thunberg, standing outside a schoolroom. We've seen it in Black Lives Matter. Someone, you know, I can't breathe, creating 100, pro, 100 countries having protests within a week. These things ripple and they're, they're unpredictable and can be very, very systemic. Uh, where they end up depends on the channeling of energy. And that's, you know, what, what marketing kind's about as well, is how you create this change of consciousness. It's happening all the time. I mean, what, what you see in gender politics now uh, is a revolution compared to even 10 years ago. The speed at which people's consciousness have changed. What's acceptable? What's no longer acceptable? And language changing. Everything changing. Um, and this, this is how change happens. People think, this is not, just not acceptable. So what I take away from that is, is that, I mean, we can talk about the leadership qualities and why he was by far the most impressive leader, I think, um, in the 20th century and probably so far in the 21st. But, um, but it, it was that the scale of, of what was happening uh, and the relationship between, you know, I was living in Paris, I was working at the OECD when the Berlin Wall came down. So it felt to me like a European experience I had no thought in the first months that it would transform my life. It did within two months of coming down. Mandela was released from, from jail. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, among many other great qualities, uh, of course, President Mandela must have been one of the greatest ever political storytellers. I, uh, I don't know, Ian, to what degree you think of yourself as a storyteller, um, but of course, after 23 books, uh, you've been interviewed by more or less every major broadcaster, multiple documentary series for the BBC and others. Um, you've chosen storytelling as an increasingly important part of how you affect change in the world. So I wonder, you know, how is, what's most important to you in, in producing these stories? And if we take Rescue as an example, um, what's most important to you in making that a story that isn't just a good book, but that actually is part of creating change? Mm. It's interesting, Paul. I, I have never, I've never thought of myself as a storyteller, but <laughs> maybe I have to accept I, I uh, at least in some way. Um, um, you know, I write books, I write articles, I teach, I run research groups, do the BBC stuff, all for the same reason, which is I do think we engage in a battle of ideas. Um, and I think there's some, I, I think that's how change happens. Uh, that you, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in, in argument, in, in making a case and, 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 I, and I'm often wrong. I'm not saying I'm right, but it's the process of discussion of thinking that makes us uniquely human. I, I think that it's a differentiator between us and somebody all other species on earth. Um, I'm not saying superior, but different and gives us different capabilities. Uh, and, and has it led to our evolution to where we are today? And we are on a journey as humanity, uh, a, a journey which has had some really, really, really catastrophic periods, we almost went extinct at various times, but a journey which, which is overall, particularly over my lifetime, been, been just extraordinarily good in terms of the number of people uh, in the world who are living better lives, measured on virtually any metric you want to look at, but at great cost to the planet. Um, and, and so the question is, how do you solve the problems? You know, it's what the Oxford Martin School is about. It's what South Africa, Mandela was about. It's what the World Bank is about, although many would contest its ideas. Um, and it's and in a way, it's what teaching and, and books are about. It's just 
here are some issues that I care passionately about. This is why I think about them in these ways. This is what I think the evidence is. You, you dear reader, you know, make up your mind. Hopefully you read the book, otherwise you can't begin the discussion. And that's always the balance. And it's not something I'm very good at. I mean, I've never had a book sell a million copies uh, or anything. That's one of the reasons I like doing radio. I like doing TV. I like doing lots of different languages. Now podcasts, you know, I mean, I don't like social media, but I'm on Twitter for that reason, Ian underscore golden, uh, for those that are interested. So I think it's, it's a battle of ideas and it's becoming more intense. The question now is how you get out of your silos because fake news is terrifying. Um, that, and we're moving into a world of distortion of, of views, taking things out of context and distorting them, which is to, to me very scary. Um, but it's all part of the same process. Having said all of that, I have a constraint now. Um, I mean, not only <laughs> all we have is our reputation. So you don't say something stupid that you're going to regret. That worries me. But, but I'm also an Oxford professor. I've got, to, I've got to hold myself up to Oxford standards. I've got to be fact-based. I've got to be evidence-based. I've got to be able to write in a way which is not purely polemical. Um, and that is, you know, maybe when I retire, I'll do things differently. Um, but I have to, you know, my test for myself is do I walk into the common room and does someone snigger at anything I've written? Whether they not, I mean, whether they agree with me or disagree, I don't care. We have great debates. I even have colleagues that were Brexiteers, amazingly. I, but the point is, I don't want anyone to say, you're making this up. Uh, well, you don't have the evidence. When you, that, that would worry me deeply. And, and so that's a constraint uh, which is created by, by my environment. And when I hear the word storytelling, it sort of evokes in me the idea as if you're making something up. Um, I don't think I make anything up. Um, I think I tell it like I see it by putting joining dots that are that are evidence based. No, fair enough, uh, Ian. I think that's uh, you know we we think of storytelling as a way of. Uh, Sort of drawing in the the, mm -hmm. the reader and and sort of getting their attention to the to the world's problems and 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 you've done that extremely well. I absolutely enjoyed reading your book. It it kept me hooked, you know, page to page. Um, and and I think that's you know sort of and and with so much evidence. I mean, I, I it was completely packed in with uh, with with that information to back it all up. And I think just sort of switching to the business side of it you know the business world we, we've talked about some of the, the the multilaterals and the governments and things like that but you know you have been an advisor to over 100 businesses leading businesses and and had held many non-executive directorships of global corporations to what degree do business leaders engage with you on an agenda such as rescue and how do you make it relevant to their priorities yeah, um, I have engaged a lot with business um, in different capacities uh, and, yeah, been on boards and <laughs> on virtually every committee on, every, on, on the boards. Um, and I think the, what, what I believe is that business is on a journey too. I mean, I would not go on a business board that had a reputational risk. I mean, and I have resigned uh, at times from, from boards. Uh, but the, the, the issue really is, are they able within their constraints to be making the right decisions? Are they, you know, this ESG agenda, which is new language for what's always been something which good companies have cared about, um, and is, is vital, but it's essential that it's not a greenwashing or a marketing tool. That it's that, you know, you have the corporate affairs director or someone writing the ESG package, and then you sort of, it's a tick box and 
and it's not really affecting the business. Um, I'm sure arms manufacturers and coal companies have ESG policies too. Um, and so the, the question is, how do you drive business to do the right thing? And how as a non-exec or as a CEO, can you really shape it? And what risks can you take? And obviously, it's very, very different if you're a listed company, um, if, you re- if, you, if you're facing your consumers or you're a commodity producer, um, private companies. There's lots of different layers to this. Um, but I, my agenda is generally uh, to try and work with companies to shift them and to support, you know, I do a lot of board strategy, board away day, um, take companies on journeys. Um, for example, I worked with BP uh, on its new strategy, which if you read the strategy on the website, this was with Bob Dudley, the previous CEO. Um, if you read that, I think it's radical for an oil company, what they are saying, basically getting to net zero for a oil company. I mean, that's a big thing to say. But I wanted, you know, and with Bob, be convinced this was real. And it, it was a slow process over multiple years. But in the end, although people would criticize me for having worked with them, I feel I was part of that journey to, uh, which was worthwhile. Um, not happy with everything they're doing. I'm not engaged anymore with them. But um, that's that's when you feel that actually there's something very significant that is changing. This is very different to what I read a lot of, which is um, these ridiculous numbers of fin- of firms saying they're going to do X, Y, and Z. And you know there's no accountability and they're going to do them by 2050 or 2030. What I want to know is what you're doing this year or next year while you are CEO or you are the, the head of some division or some group. What are you doing in the next five years? And are you going to have your pay docked? Are you going to put your bonus on the line for this? Are you serious about it? Um, and that's where I think boards need to uh, need, and CEO boards need to hold CEOs and direct executive directors to account CEOs and chairman need to hold people to account uh, and and they need to be ambitious you know so someone like Paul Pullman at Unilever when he said we're going to reduce our water use I think he said by 50 percent in 10 years everyone told him it was impossible and they did it because that it was built into the incentive structure and he had told the shareholders. And now you see the debate around Unilever and ESG. Same thing happened at Danone, uh, where it seems like the shareholders felt the, the chief executive was right. The other thing that's important to recognize about business, which I, I, I only recognized you know, after a few years, is there's no long term if there's no short term. So the idea that you focus on the long term and do the right things is great. But if you screw the short term up and you get sold or go bankrupt or you lose your job, you don't have a conversation about, you know, about the long term. So how you balance short term and long term and what you do to be profitable in the short term, to have the money to invest in the long term without compromising your principles in the the short term because it's profitable is, I think, the real trade-off. And it's the sort of thing that boards need to be much more deeply and CEOs need to be involved in. So I'm very sympathetic to CEOs that that have this challenge. Um, And and analysts and marketing, uh, not, not, you know, quarterly reports, that sort of thing. Uh, it's it's water torture, basically. Um, and it drives out resilience and it drives the reason, one of the reasons that banks were so vulnerable in the financial crisis. And one of the reasons that we see the supply crisis that we see today in supply chains is because of this just-in-time delivery, just-in-time quarterly reports. Working capital in, um, that's not being used is as far as the analysts are concerned, working capital wasted. 
So it's just in time, no spare capacity, whether it's a hospital with no oxygen bottles, uh, no masks, and no spare nurses, and uh, as a result of privatization and corporatization, or whether it's in any other part of the system, spare capacity has been driven down because it's capital tied up. And that's a problem with the accounting system, which is fundamental. Um, and the banks drove down their capital on their balance sheets because that's what the, the incentive structure around the CEO's bonus, the dividends they were paying, and everything else was set up to maximize the throughput of the system and minimize the extent to which you hold any spare capacity. Well, that's a recipe for fragility. And, and so the change in business has to happen at all levels. It has to happen at the regulatory level. It has to happen at the professional services and standards level, accounting systems. And it has to happen at the board level and it has to happen within the company. And it's all bound up. And all of it needs quite fundamental change. And it's very interesting how big business has had a long time to become extremely efficient. Uh, but sometimes the pursuit of efficiency, as you say, creates hidden fragilities and is the, it can be the enemy of effectiveness in the long run. Yeah. Um, many in previous exchanges, we've heard similar concerns. We had an exchange with Sir Tim Smith, um, Tim Jackson and Daniela Barone Suarez on the future of um, capitalism. Um, and they also recognize that ESG um, can be implemented without actually changing the core nature of what industry you're in and cited mm. the example of tobacco businesses that had, you know, were in the top five in the world for ESG ratings and so on. Um, so many of our members, Ian, do run marketing activities for, for businesses of all size, but we also support a lot of small charities and social enterprises. Now, um, given the scale of some of the problems you've talked about. It's quite easy for a small NGO, for example, frankly, even a huge NGO, uh, to feel pretty dwarfed by those challenges. Um, what role do you see for small civil society organizations in, in bringing about change? Well, I'm, uh, I'm very sympathetic. I'm the chair of one. It only has uh, one staff member or two staff members that fortunately just raised a bit more money. It's called coreecon.org. It's trying to change economics. Uh, core, C-O-R-E dash econ.org. Anyone that's interested in changing economics, uh, should look, it's free online curriculum, which millions of people around the world are, are now adopting. Um, you know, it's just one example. I'm also, uh, was a, a trustee, now honorary trustee of Comic Relief, mm -hmm. um, which is, which under it, you know, sort of like the mothership, and under it, there, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of, of small charities that are being supported by, by Comic Relief, doing the most extraordinary things in the UK uh, and globally. Uh, so I'm deeply sympathetic. And, and I also think what we've seen in the pandemic is a lot of, you know, a lot of charities have gone to the wall. Uh, funding has stopped. Um, something like a third of the sports clubs and community centers in the UK closed down um, during the pandemic. I mean, it's at a time when it's desperately needed, uh, basically funding dried up. Obviously people couldn't go at, at, for a time, but now they can again. Uh, mental health, there's just huge, huge need. Frail care, these are all charities um, often that are running these things and they are in deep crisis. Uh, I think there should be much more tax deductibility for giving to charitable institutions like there is in the US uh, across the board. I think we need a much um, deeper conversation around societal support for charities. Of course, not all charities are good. Um, there's some very nasty political parties who call themselves charities um, or organizations. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, charities, a word that covers a multitude of different activities, but I think positive, positive uh, charities are to be sustained and they're signs of a healthy society. Um, and we need to have a much more vital, vital role for them. Having said that, I don't see charities as a substitute for what governments or local authorities um, should be doing. And too often, uh, charities 
are carrying the brunt of it. Um, you know, you have charities supplying food to people that are starving on the streets of England, um, that are housing people mm-hmm. on the streets of England. Uh, this shouldn't be happening. Um, that you have to, I mean, uh, the charity is doing a wonderful thing. I'm not knocking the charities, but that they have to, that you, that you have to be making, you know, food, you have to have food banks and things run by charities because everything else has fallen apart. Uh, is a sad commentary to me about it, um, about where we are uh, as a society. It's wonderful there's that solidarity, but it's, you know, part of the argument of rescue is that we need the systemic change in society that, that, that doesn't allow this sort of thing to happen as well. Absolutely, and I think the the idea of, you know, what you just said here is, is really the that these charities shouldn't be doing these things in, and, and the system should be doing more of it. And somehow that is sort of related to the cooperation between us, you know, like how do we come together to, to force the, the powers that be, the, not just, uh, you know, the businesses, but the governments and hold them account. And, and I think, you know, we want to figure out like, so just what ways this can happen and then what opportunities do you see for new forms of cooperation in addressing our challenges? And, and what ambition led you to found the Oxford Martin School? Yeah, these are big questions, but let me try and uh, give you sort of summary answers. Um, I think part of the challenge is that we're sitting with a, a post-war architecture for governance and and in some and actually in terms of government, it's not a post-war; it's a Westphalian system of, of national government, ancient, which doesn't recognize the huge transformation of societies and the way that what matters, the, the role of cities, the role of the private sector, the role of business organizations, the role of charities and charitable organizations, the role of of other actors, and when. You know, what's one of the remarkable things about studying the First and Second World Wars is there were just very few actors. You basically had a few politicians, a few newspaper editors, and a few other people that sort of met in clubs and decided the fate of the nation. You know, that had advantages, things got done. Um, And you didn't have fake news in the same way that you have it today. But it had big disadvantages that there was all sorts of actors that were disempowered, they were told what to do. So we need an architecture which reflects the fact that most things that affect us don't actually require that and that there should be much more decentralization of decision-making, much more community-based, much more ability in our towns, in our communities and elsewhere to decide things which affect us, but subject to an understanding that we can't sort of create an island. And this is where I part company with a lot of libertarians. You know, I don't think the rich should should basically create an enclave um, and say, the world seems fine to us uh, because we can afford garbage collection and water and the Christian security and everything else. Um, And the rest of the world goes to to a a very bad place. So you need redistribution. You need... and you need a nationalism and a national government that can tax and spend, uh, and you need minimum standards nationally, but you need a much bigger constellation of actors within a country, and that's also true in my view globally, and it's part of the reason, uh, and I talk about this in Rescue, why we stuck where we are in these intractable seeming negotiations on many things, is that they're basically trying to get 202 countries to agree to things and nothing happens um, because the, there's some fundamental differences, including conflicts of interest. Some are doing very well out of you know, like the oil producers or the coal producers um, out of the existing situation uh, on climate, for example. So I think we need to accept that we need to give up our knee jerk reaction. And if you have a problem, you kick it up to government. And if government has a problem, it kicks it up to the UN or some other institution because that's just a recipe for gridlock. 
Um, I think we need to accept that, and that's why part I wrote Rescue, that we need to take action as communities. That's why the new movements, like um, the climate movements, like the gender parity movements, the race movements are so important, the business movements and other actors, the city mayors mobilizing, because they can, they recognize that they can affect change in dramatic ways. And you don't have to wait for government always. Um, depends on your political system. In the US, the states are immensely powerful, uh, for example, and can do things, you know, it's almost like different countries going from one state to another in many respects. And that's important. So we need that and we need a much more asymmetric geometry of problem solving. You know, the, 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 the concept of coalitions of the willing has been rather damaged um, by Iraq. But actually, that's what we, we need, coalitions of the working. Those people that want to affect change need to get on with it and not wait. Build coalitions and not wait for the for big brother to do it for you because there's no big brother that's going to do it um, and you'll be waiting forever. So, with, you know, that's why we need to change our own lives and the way we do things. That's why this whole, you know, people say, there's no point me, whatever, buying an electric vehicle or riding a bicycle or becoming vegan or whatever because the problem is too big on climate change. Yeah, if you don't do it, no one's going to do it. Um, and if you and all your friends and then your city and then your your community and like-minded people around the world do it, then you begin to see change. So I, I think um, we need much more movement on that and particularly applying the 2080 rule. You know, what 20% of actors, and it's not only government, it's private sector, it's communities, it's others, can bring about 80% of the change. Or maybe it's you know, 5% of the actors bringing about 40% of the change, but begin begin to make the movement of change and others will follow and see that it's possible. It's um, one of the subtler aspects of rescue that on the one hand, it's, it is a, a text that implies greater intervention. I mean, you literally, the middle chunk of the book is from hands off to hands on. But on the other hand, it's not an unqualified intervention. One challenge I was going to put to you is, you know, what would you say to somebody who wanted a bit less government after all the interference of the past couple of years? Or, or to somebody, say, running a, a small social enterprise or NGO, say, in Cameroon, who thinks that we've had enough of men in UN Land Rovers. What's needed is more um, power, influence, resource in the hands of community leaders who understand the people around them and what they're going through. And I think you've actually addressed that ahead of time. So what I'd like to do now is, um, uh, as you know, Ian, we support a different charity or social enterprise with a key aspect of some of their marketing each month. And um, this time it's going to be a really exciting one um, for two reasons. Well, for three reasons. First of all, because they're great. Um, second of all, because um, this will be our first in-person as well as online uh, coffee with a cause gathering. Um, so for anyone who wants to connect online, it will be 11 to 12.30 on Friday, the 4th of March. For anyone who can be there in person, it will be in person, King's Cross, Friday, the 4th of March. And there will be some coffee from about 10.30. Um, and there'll also be a light lunch afterwards for anyone who would like to stay after. Um, secondly, it's really exciting because this cause came to us through a previous one of our exchanges. So we had an exchange on the path to climate compatible living with uh, Mike Berners-Lee, uh, John Grant and Joan Fitzgerald. Um, and in Joan's most recent book, she wrote about the sustainable redevelopment of London's King's Cross um, and positively cited the work of a community um, engagement program that was part of that redevelopment called Global Generation. Um, and so we'll be working with them in our next Coffee with a Cause. Um, and uh, if, uh, if Marina is there, um, I would love to. Hi, Marina. So it's maybe Martina got us... up close. Martina. <laughs> oh, okay, so we had a, a last. That's minute fine. I know we did a last minute switch. Yes, it was no. supposed to be Nicole. <laughs> uh, very good. Well, I look forward to to meeting you soon, and maybe you could give us a, a a nutshell sense of of what you do and how we may be able to help. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, Global Generation has been going, I think, for about 19 years. And essentially, it's come out of partnerships around the King's Cross development. So working with um, developers and the council to kind of secure uh, meanwhile spaces that we can develop into community garden spaces. And it's kind of grown from there. We're currently... Um, I think it's our sixth garden around the area. So we've we've kind of always had to move every few years as spaces kind of get then repurposed. Um, but we're currently on our biggest ever site, which is behind the British Library, and it's called the Story Garden. Um, and it's right, it's quite an interesting space because it's right next to Summers Town um, kind of community. And But then kind of the other side, you've got all the massive development and kind of Google buildings <laughs> happening and stuff. So it's at a kind of interesting juxtaposition, I think, between different societies in London. Um, we, at the Story Garden, um, so we we run a, a huge range of projects actually. So we we have community grow beds, which are um, kind of allotment beds for local residents. So people who don't have access to their own gardens or growing space, they can come and grow in the garden with support from our garden team. We work a lot with schools and youth groups in the area. So either we go to the schools and we run projects around um, their own kind of school gardens, and we do projects around gardening there or they come to the story garden and we do kind of getting back to nature projects um, with them in our space. We actually, during the lockdown, massively increased our food production and put kind of really a lot of effort into that. And that, sorry, that's my one-year-old babbling away in the background. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we now actually supply a lot of the fresh food to the local food bank, which I do agree with Ian as that that's maybe not something that we necessarily should fall to us but it's good that we've been able to help in that way and kind of supplement out a lot of the other kind of more dry goods that they get with actually some fresh locally grown vegetables and salads and things as well so that's been really beneficial um, we run a series of after school programs one of which is the generators which is for ages um 11 to 14 and that's a group that actually we will be working with marketing kind so we're really keen to develop um, a film working with our young people um, and potentially some other marketing um, material as well but actually around recruitment but for us it's really important that actually the young people we work with it's their voice so we're quite keen to see how do we bring them into this process so rather than necessarily the content and the brief coming from us that is actually coming from the young people that we work with um, so that's kind of yeah our key focus um, I suppose just just to wrap up a couple of other things around so we actually have two main garden sites and we've also just got a boat which will be on the Regent's Canal as well so we've got our main story um, garden is the story garden we've got another one in Canada water called the paper garden and then we're kind of in the process of setting up the, the floating garden um, and we've actually sorted out a lease for 999 years which will be our first permanent garden which will be um, also in King's Cross and that will be active in around two years time so we're hoping once the story garden kind of comes to an end we'll be able to move over to the permanent site and then we're not going to have to pack up and leave every couple of years after that so that's really exciting um, and everything we build it's around kind of circular economy reuse of materials how do we kind of upskill local young people um, through that construction process and kind of co-design, co-construction um, as much as possible. So it's all about creating the spaces together rather than us kind of just coming in and creating a garden space. It's about building that with the local community and then really kind of having ownership of that space. Wonderful. What a, what a fabulous, <laughs> exciting project to engage with. Um, I'm not surprised at all that Joan wrote about it so nicely in, in her book. Um, and with some of the statistics that we had been talking about earlier in our conversation, really there can't be much more important than strengthening the voice of young people on the sustainability agenda. So um, for all Marketing Kind members, online Friday 4th of March from uh, 11 o'clock to 12.30 or in person at King's Cross um, with the option of arriving early for coffee, staying late for lunch if you'd like to. I think we're so excited to get together to see 
um, what you have with your community gardens and, and your facilities. And also to meet each other. many of us, because we've been born early in the pandemic, many of us haven't had a chance to meet in person. So that will be fabulously exciting for all Marketing Kind members. If you're not a Marketing Kind member, there's still time before then to correct that. Um, if you can't correct that for some reason, but still have some way that you can help um, global generation then drop us a line and we will connect you so that you're able to provide that help um, I also want to you know because we're unlikely in this conversation although Ian says it's the slowest 90 minutes that we'll have for the rest of our lives I wish it was slower because I'd like this to continue for much longer um, but we're gonna not going to be able to exhaust Ian's cerebral capacity in an hour and a half so I really recommend everyone to read Rescue um, I actually first came to Ian's work um, through a prior book, The Age of Discovery. And as I was mentioning before we started, I think there should be a word to describe the particular emotion you feel when you read something and you wish you'd been able to write it yourself. Well, that's what I feel when I read Ian's work. Um, I do feel for people interested in marketing, so we have all sorts of change agents at Marketing Kind, but many people who happen to have job uh, marketing in the job title as well. Um, and I do feel that business in the past and marketing has been too transactional um, and too much focused on the individual transaction at the expense of the context in which that takes place. Um, uh, some would say that economists have also suffered from um, from that limited focus. You have the phrase in economics, all things being equal, which essentially assumes the context away. Um, that applies much less, of course, in development economics, the, the, the branch of economics that Ian would be um, uh, closest to. Um, but I do think we need to get much better at understanding the holistic environment in which we're operating in, and that there is a huge opportunity for marketers and people with marketing as a discipline in their toolkit to play a stronger world, uh, role in helping their organizations better understand the world in which they're operating in so that they can find better ways to add value to the lives of all of their stakeholders. And there are really few better ways um, to go about that and fostering that more holistic mindset than taking an interest in uh, in Ian's work um, uh, and, and the work of his colleagues and others like him as well. Um, if you want to pop your questions in the Q&A box, if you keep the shorter you keep them, the easier they are to pick out. Um, but I wonder, Ian, just to, to kick off um, this part of our conversation, to what degree and how um, in, a, in a world of rescue do we need to change our conception of what a, a good life to lead looks like? might be on mute this must be the common phrase of, of the pandemic <laughs> rescue us from you might be on mute um there's there's some questions in the q a that are related to this this question of how do you how do you measure and what 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 about gdp um but just before i get that I just, i'm just i've also looked at the chat um and uh, I, there's some really good comments, and I just say to Martin Utley, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think the U.S. is a model that we should follow. Uh, I, I just think it's a good example of, of uh, that you can do things. And the point I was particularly making is, for example, under Trump, his refusal to sign the Paris Agreement didn't stop California, New York, and some other states committing to do it. So you could do things at the company level and at the state level and the city level that the federal government um, didn't do. And the federal government's lack of support wasn't an excuse not to act um, then. And that, that, that I think is something which, which is a very important lesson. Um, so how do you measure a good life and, and what, what are we striving for? Um, my, I'm very influenced by Amartya Sen. Um, incidentally, if we, <laughs> you very kindly recommended my book, uh, Paul. I'd recommend his book, his memoir, uh, his recent book. I think it's called My Place in the World or something like that. It's quite an extraordinary book. Uh, but um, 
the one has to have capabilities in order to be able to exercise freedom. Uh, you have to be alive, you have to be healthy, you have to have education, you have to have rights, not these gender rights, uh, if women want to exercise their freedoms. Um, and, and so you very quickly end up with sort of a very broad economic basis for what's needed. Um, that goes beyond GDP or average numbers or anything like that. Um, that's why inequality matters, uh, because it's, it, it, GDP is a mask which hides this huge variation, not only how different people are doing within a country. Um, you can have very high levels of GDP, in, and a hugely good society or a hugely bad society in terms of what the majority of people experience. Um, but it's also, it, it's only one metric and we really need to move towards dashboards. The Human Development Report of the United Nations, the UNDP pioneered that, uh, is one example. Uh, it's not without its problems either. And then there's a whole lot of other reports like the World Economic Forum has a whole lot of reports on gender, on competitiveness, on different aspects, environment. Um, but my own view is that these that that you can't apply the same questions to all countries because it very much depends on your stage of development and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so if your objective is to overcome starvation and poverty, uh, you need a different set of objectives to the objectives in the UK, for example. And that's why, and this relates to one of the questions in, um, from Donna in the Q&A, that's why growth matters. Growth, in my view, growth matters for two reasons, or three. The one is, if you're all very poor, <laughs> like you are in many African countries, or the overwhelming majority of people are very poor, there's no way to escape poverty without growing. So the idea of not growing is a luxury. It's an idea that you can only really have if you're rich already um, and have enough money to fund what you need in your society, health, education, roads, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. The second concern I have in, the no, in, in not focusing on growth is that actually what the growth we have is terrible. It's distorted. It's only benefiting a few people. You can't move to a zero carbon economy without basically closing down all the coal power stations and building new stuff, renewable power, wind, solar, whatever and a new grid to go with it, and to retrofit all the houses away from gas to other things, heat pumps, other forms of energy. That, invi that involves a massive investment that's got to come from somewhere and will meet growth. We've got to get rid of all of our cars and replace them with different cars or pu public transport systems. We need to change our roads to make them pedestrian safety and cycle safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wherever you look, you see that the system is not fit for purpose. That means, <laughs> A, closing down a lot of stuff, and B, building a lot of stuff. That's growth. You can't, you can't close and build without... I mean, growth doesn't mean that the total thing gets bigger. It means it's different. You've got to grow big parts of the economy. And that requires investment, and that require and that investment is going to come from the private sector. It's come from the public sector. Um, and then the third reason, I think it's in, uh, important, which is a bad reason. The second reason is a good reason that we want a different economy. The third reason is that we're spending money on the wrong things, not only in terms of energy and so on but the wrong places, the wrong sorts of things, bad food, bad farming systems, et cetera, and we need different ones. 
but also on debt repayment and unproductive things. When you do that, you know, nuclear missiles and things, when you do that, you, you need to pay. When you're in a debt hole, as the UK is, you can't get out of it unless you grow. <laughs> um, and unless you write off the debt, which is you know, a radical idea, which some, some think, but I don't think is workable, um, you, you sort of create hyperinflation or do something to get rid of your debt. Um, then basically you want debt to become a smaller and smaller part of your expenditure. So when we pay tax, we're not paying, you know, kids are not paying tax to pay the debt that I've created, but they're actually investing in their society and health, education, research, and so on. And that you need, I'm afraid, growth for. So uh, GDP is not a good thing to focus on only. But if you don't have it, if you don't have GDP growth in the right things, the quality of the growth, the content of the growth, that's what matters. And that's why we need to focus on things like well-being, air pollution. There are lots of other things on our dashboard that should guide us, you know, other than GDP. But none of them say that you shouldn't have GDP or GDP growth. So, Ian, I want to point you to Sean's question uh, because this is something to do with the, the, mm. the just sort of the positive direction, right? So, considering what's happened in Ottawa, uh, you know, so national crisis created by a small minority, effectively using technology to cling to false narratives, mm. you know, how how does one engage and direct this energy in a positive direction? Yeah, well, I'm I'm you know and do push back or <laughs> participants push back because I'm, you know, I welcome the debate. I'm pretty, I believe that we've created an anarchic system in some respects. That the, the platforms on, are getting away with spreading lies. And a newspaper would not be able to do that. They'd be sued for libel, for falsehood and so on. The, the um, standards of communication that we hold the BBC or even a private radio in the UK to um, or a newspaper are not being applied on social media platforms. And that is, crea that is creating, in my view, very, very dangerous echo chambers which... Uh, of ideas which, if they only affected the individuals, that's fine. People have the right to have crazy ideas, but they don't have the right to kill me with their crazy ideas or to destroy my economy uh, with their crazy ideas. And that's where I think we should be much more regulatory. In other words, I think it should be the responsibility of Facebook to uh, be accountable for lies that are spread on its platform. Now, they'll tell you they can't do it. Well, that's their problem. It's not my problem. I'm saying that they are responsible for people spreading whatever, in the same way they are for sex abuse videos or other things. These are content providers. Um, they're not just platform providers. They influence it and they make huge, huge, huge amounts of money because they advertise the content. So they know what the content is because they've got that's how they that's their revenue model. It's driven by the content and they're driving us into, into crazy silos. They make more and more money the more clicks you have. Um, so, um, you know, what's happening in Canada, we've seen it. Uh, elsewhere, we've seen it in the anti-vax movement, we've seen the attacks on scientists in the UK. Um, this is dangerous for democracy because there's no accountability in the, in the process. There's no, there's no saying you can't say that. Um, and I believe that uh, 
you know, we have a system where you have to have your kid vaccinated if you want to send them to school. Because it's a collective good. We have a system where you can't carry around a gun and shoot at, in public because it's our, our safety in the UK. But you can walk around without a mask and, sp and spread a germ that could kill me. What's the difference? And I think we need to think very deeply about these public responsibilities, collective goods. And I'm on the side of those that are not very libertarian on this. I believe if something is a, is a safety issue, in the same way that we've banned, we, we banned smoking in restaurants because we think it's bad for our health, but we're not prepared to ban people breathing germs on us that we know have a very high contagion rate. Where's the consistency on this? Um, so I'm, I think the French and other countries which have basically said, you know, and some, some in the UK that um, you're not coming to work if you're not vaccinated. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm sort of on this. I'm not very libertarian, as I said. Mm. <laughs> if it's public safety, I think it's pub the public has every right to enforce regulations. I guess uh, if we were to um, do a pre-mortem on why we might fail to rescue ourselves, um, it, it sounds like the sort of momentum of existing systems is probably the, the biggest uh, obstacle to overcome. Yeah. And of course, psychologically, you know, the difficulty, a difficulty with systems change is that the current system is our default mode. And we spend so much time in that. You, uh, you mentioned, Ian, uh, in your book that your wife, a, a psychotherapist, was very helpful in some of the framing um, and also um, uh, in, this, in looking at the topic of well-being that you alluded to earlier. But I wonder if to any degree um, some of the ideas from psychotherapy um, have influenced how you think about some of the psychological uh, causes as well as consequences uh, of our problems and how do we you know what's the most effective way to actually break out of our default systems I'm not a therapist <laughs> um, uh, and I don't have that toolkit I'm just a economist which are particularly badly prepared for that because we tend to believe in incentives um, and, and and sort of rational humanity um, although there's a growing branch of economics, which which doesn't, um, I am, I I I go back to my experience of different places. I don't think people are good or bad. Um, I you know I think people are basically good, but are framed by their historical circumstances, by their childhood, by the information they get, by everything else. And I think people are the same everywhere, basically. I don't think, you know, that one nation is somehow in any way superior to another or one group. Um, but they act very differently because they're different frame. And that really comes down to everything from the child experiences you have, um, the nutrition you have, uh, the, what you see and observe around you in your family, in your community. You grow up in a, in, a, in a gang culture, as a lot of kids tragically do, say, in Central America. You're in a very high probability. You're not going to respect life, and you're going to end up a gangster yourself, especially if there's no jobs and way out um, of that. And the so I think, I think, you know, what I take is we frame by that, but I also take that we can change Really, you cannot find a person here that supported apartheid. <laughs> All a bit, you know. Um, whereas we know that eighty percent of the white population did, um, seventy percent uh, did. It's just like. And it's like being in Germany and trying to find someone that was a Nazi, you know, in, in the post-war period. Um, people can change, and they change really fundamentally to the extent that they don't actually digest 
that the majority of them were something else. Now, they might still harbor some of the views they had, but they wouldn't admit to it publicly and act on them uh, because it would be totally unacceptable. And, and I think that, so, you know, no one can argue that people can't change. We see it time and time and time again. Uh, and, and I think the question is, do you create the conditions where the old behavior is no longer acceptable, where the new behavior becomes more attractive, and that the incentive structures, if you want to call that, of society, of what's, what's acceptable and no longer acceptable, change. You want to accelerate that, and it's accelerating. You see young people all over the, over the world at the moment. Um, and I think, so I, I'm, you know, that's my cause for optimism. You know, I'm older uh, than maybe many of the participants in, in this marketing kind um, webinar, but the changes actually in your lifetime are just so, so bizarre and strong and positive on them for the most part. You see some negative things too. You know, I would prefer not to have seen the fights I've seen over Brexit uh, in the UK or the election of President Trump in the US. But I do, and this reflects my economic background, I don't think either of those things would have happened had it not been for the financial crisis. You know, I think they were the direct outcome of a collapse of credibility of the authorities to manage a global world. Um, to, and crises, and the pandemic as well, has real political consequences and real conscious, consciousness. People felt differently about themselves in the Midwest of the US or in the North of England after the financial crisis, after stagnating wages for 10 years, no hope, and the elites were laughing all their way to the bank and no bankers went to jail. People felt differently about the system. Their consciousness changed as a result of the financial crisis about good and bad, what they had to do to get out of the situation, their role as actors in it, et cetera. And it can change again. As, as a, a, a perhaps a likely, a, with the timeline, likely a final question, but uh, you write, of course, the, the provocative sentiment at the heart of rescue is that the, the pandemic could paradoxically become the event that rescues humanity. Um, what one thing can we all take, what one thing can we all do to increase the likelihood? Because I noticed the conditional tense could be the event that rescues humanity. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so what, what one thing can we all do to increase the probability that that happens? Well, every, you know, I don't, there's no one size fits all. We all need to, and you are through marketing kind, we all need to act through the levers that we have access to, the people we have access to, the ways that we do through our skill sets and things. And everyone is different, but it's collective because it's a, a desire to move in the same direction. I think the big thing is to really recognize that the system is intrinsically broken. And that business as usual is gonna give us inevitably more pandemics, etc. So, and that radical change, although it seems a very scary idea, is actually a lot safer, more predictable uh, and certain in terms of its outcomes and sustainability. By radical change, I don't mean um, very radical, much less radical we've, than we've experienced in the last two years. We've, we've had radical change. Just let's not go back. And, you know, so, you know, get our politicians to support the World Health Organization to become a credible organization to stop the next pandemic. Uh, act on climate change and we can all do an immense amount uh, in our own lives on that uh, ensure that one's voice is being heard in the community and you've had you know you are doing that um, including through the king's cross charity that you're supporting uh, so the, it, it's wrong for anyone to be prescriptive about other people's lives I think that is 
None of us can get into the skin of someone else and say, what can you be most effective at doing? But what I see in marketing kind and what I see in so many organizations is that people are doing what they can uh, and influencing where they can. And I think that's great. And, you know, we need to support each other in that process. Thank you, Ian. This has been such a fascinating and important conversation for us. I hate to be the one to draw it to a close. But, uh, you know, we like to end our gatherings on time. So we, we're going to draw the curtain here. Yeah. It just really leaves me to thank you very much, Ian. We have learned so much from you and you have left us with a lot to think about. 